If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, and you can certainly follow with us uh, on uh, the board, on our screen, when we get going. But let me give you my outline. There's a bulletin there, and if you want to take notes, uh, you're welcome to do that in our bulletin. The cross of Jesus. I want to talk to you about the cross of Jesus. And folks, you have to understand, the crucifixion by Romans was the cruelest way to die. The cruelest way. And we'll uh, point this out more in just a few minutes. The three things I want to share with you this morning. Number one, the greatest example of humility. The greatest example of humility. Jesus humbled himself and went to the cross. In the courtroom, even Pilate says, are you not going to say anything? He humbled himself in the courtroom. He wasn't loud. He wasn't belligerent. All right? He came. Folks, I hope you understand that was his purpose in life. He left heaven to die for us. He have left heaven so that we can be saved and purchase salvation for us. So we see the greatest example of humility. Number two, the greatest act of love. Stephen Betty spoke of that, and we'll be talking about that in just a second. And the third thing is the greatest testimony ever shared. I'm telling you, it changed a Roman soldier's life. You have to understand, Roman soldiers were trained to be cruel, to train to do their job. But yet, at the end, you will see that this man publicly made a statement that was incredible, totally incredible. Matter of fact, in our text, Pilate thought he could avoid making a decision by uh, sending Jesus to Herod, but Herod only sent Jesus back and mocked him. Then the governor offered the people a choice between Jesus of Nazareth or Barabbas, who was a murderer and insurrectionist. Little did Pilate know the crowd led by the chief priest would choose Barabbas over Jesus. Pilate told the crowd three times, I find no fault in him, speaking of Jesus. But they kept screaming, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. Pilate decided to scourge Jesus, hoping that the beating would satisfy them, but but they, in their rage, would not release Jesus under no conditions. The governor finally gave in and delivered Jesus to be crucified. Let's see, in starting in verse 15, Mark 15, 15, the greatest example of humility. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, and gratify simply means to please the crowd. Folks, there's a lot of people that just want to please the crowd. Many people. Released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him. You have to understand that a scourging was a beating. Okay? They would put the man, the, they would put Jesus on a pole. They would tie his hands above his head. Two Roman soldiers would get on each side with leather whips. And at the end of the leather whip, leather whips. Uh, there was leather there, but also tied to that were fragments of bones and sometimes even lead. And they could give him 39 stripes. And you have to understand, folks, what Jesus had already been through. He'd been through three trials. He'd been up all night, okay? He was physically and emotionally spent. And after the beating, matter of fact, uh, there were people, the, there were folks that, that are crucified that actually died during the beatings. They did not even have strength enough to get through those. But Jesus endured the beating. Uh, I tell you, the passion of the Christ, I can't watch it every, every year. I usually watch it around Easter time. But I'm telling you, it is the closest uh, film, movie, that I've ever seen to the real account of what Jesus went through for us. Verse 16, Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called uh, Praetorium. And basically it was Pilate's court and where he lived. And they called together the whole garrison. It wasn't just a few Roman soldiers. It was everybody that was in town at that time. They thought maybe a riot was going to happen. Maybe there was going to be trouble. 
So he was surrounded by many, many soldiers. And they clothed him with purple. And we know that is a sign of, of you know, a, a king, of royalty. And they were just making fun of him. Okay, They were making fun of him doing that. And they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And again, folks, I kid you not, I've seen the crown of thorns. And the, the sticker parts are about this long. And they wrapped it around and then even, even pushing it down and in, in going into his scalp. And they began to uh, salute him and say, Hail, King of the Jews! And again, they were mocking him. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat upon him. When when they struck struck him with that reed, that crown went down even further and dug deeper into his skull. But I am telling you folks, there is no reason ever to spit on another human being. No reason. You have no excuse. No excuse. But yet, they did our Jesus this way. And I'm just telling you folks, as the song said, Steve, he could have called 10,000 angels. But he didn't. Why? Because he loved you. Because he was born to die for your sins. That's the reason he left heaven. When Adam and Eve sinned, we were all under the curse of sin. And God found a way. God took the perfect Son of God. I know people have problems with that, but folks, I am telling you, He was born of a virgin. He did not have that sin nature. God placed Him in Mary's womb according to the Word of God. Everything I say today, I can pray Prove to you in the Word of God. And bowing the knee, they worshipped Him. And folks, they really weren't worshipping them, Him. They were just making fun of our Jesus. And when they had mocked Him, they took the purple off of Him. And you have to understand, you don't know how long that robe was on there. And the longer that robe was on there, the more it stuck to His bleeding back. And I'm telling you, I don't even like it when I have to pull a Band-Aid off of my arm. But can you imagine how that felt when they did that? Folks, I am telling you, Jesus was the suffering servant and put His own clothes on Him and led Him out to crucify Him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon of Serene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. One of the things they made the prisoners do is they would make them at least take the beam. Some people believe it was the whole cross, but it could have been either way. And sometimes they would just strap that beam to their back. And Jesus was so dehydrated. He was so physically worn down and emotionally worn down. He fell under the weight of the cross. And he had this man at this place. One of my favorite Easter songs is Watch the Lamb. Folks, I'm telling you, I don't really think we understand all that he went through mentally, physically, and emotionally at this crucifixion. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is pl- translated place of school. There's two reasons they named that this. Some say it was because looking on the hill of Calvary, it looks like a school. The rocks form into a school. But probably more exact would be it was a place of death, folks. People went there to die. They went there to die. Then they gave him wine wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. Why? Because uh, it was a numbing agent, and he didn't want that. He wanted to feel every part of the pain, every part of that for you and I. He took that beating for you. 
He walked up that cross in that way for you. It was love is why he did it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now, it was the third hour, and the third hour was at 9 a.m. in the morning. The trial probably ended up about 6 a.m. that morning, and all this that was going on took place in between there. And when someone is crucified, they laid the wooden cross on the ground. And they laid the person on the cross, and they would take spikes, not nails, folks, spikes, and they would nail the hands, both hands and feet, into that cross. And once they got that done, the, the hole that was dug there, dug there, they would pick up the cross and they would just push it in the ground and it would come down and you just hear this thud and it would rip the wounds that Jesus had. And it was the third hour and they crucified Him. And this was the inscription of His accusation which was written king of the Jews. Folks, they did not give that as a compliment. The Jews were enraged because of that. Because Jesus, the Son of God, was in their presence and they would not even recognize Him as the Messiah. Would not. And I just it just blows my mind that someone could be around Jesus and see the miracles that He had done and watched him preach, and watched his life, and not acknowledge him as the Son of God. But folks, people reject Jesus every day. Every day. Hold your finger there, and go with me to Philippians 2. Philippians 2. The humble servant. The greatest example of humility. Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. We believe they are equal. God the Father who created everything. God the Son who is Jesus Christ. And God the Holy Spirit. We call it the Trinity. All three of those are seen in the Word of God. All three of them have a specific purpose in our lives. But made Himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. That's a slave, folks and coming in the likeness of man. I'm telling you, he felt the pain. He would feel, feel anything that we feel. And so you can see how cruel the cross of Jesus was. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Oh, folks, as we come to the Lord's Supper today, we need to be humble as we take, partake of the Lord's Supper. We need to humble ourselves before God, realizing that we are not deserving of His mercy and grace, but He loves us. I've even had people tell me, I'm not taking it because I don't deserve it. Folks, you'll never deserve it, ever. That's why we have a time of invitation. That's why I'm preaching the Word right now so that you can get your heart right with God now before you take the Lord's Supper. So we see the greatest example of humility, and I want you to see the greatest example of love. Look back in our text, Mark 15, verse 27. And with him they also crucified two robbers, one to the right and one to the left. So the Scripture was fulfilled which says He was numbered with the transgressors. And you, you, you can see He died between two thieves. They deserved what they got. But Jesus had done nothing wrong. And those who passed, passed by blasphemed Him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, you destroy the temple and build it up in three days. Save yourself and come down. From the cross. They were making fun of him. He told them exactly in his preaching what he could do. But folks, he was talking about his body. He was ta not talking about the physical temple. He was saying, after th three days, 
I would arise. And folks, I'm telling you, it came true. I'll speak of that in just a second. Save yourself. If you are who you are, come down off the cross. Folks, he could have done that, but he chose to stay. He chose to die and shed his blood, his broken body for our salvation. Likewise, the chief priests also mocked among themselves with the scribes and said he saved others. Himself he cannot save. You talk about attitudes. You talk about attitudes. You talk about hate. You talk about people that despised Jesus. They did. The Romans did that. Even his own countrymen hated him. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and we may believe. Folks, they were going to see, but yet they still would not believe. See, God has given every one of you sitting here today a choice. You don't have to accept the Bible. You don't have to separate the sacrifice that Jesus done for you. He's given you a choice. But I'm telling you, in my personal life, in, in life, and many in here would also say it was the best decision I ever made in my life. Even those who crucified with him reviled, which would be the soldiers. Now the when the sixth hour noon had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Midday, darkness fell. Why? Because I'm, I'm just telling you, it wasn't a lunar eclipse as some think it was. It was God shutting down the light. Jesus was the light. He was being treated like an animal. He was being beaten. He was went through all this for you and I. And it was a dark day in history, folks. It was a dark day. You talk about injustice. You talk about injustice. And at the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., so I'm telling you, from 9 o'clock to 3 in the afternoon, Jesus suffered six hours of agony. Six hours of agony. Then Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabbatai, which says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Folks, God, when Jesus and the sin of mankind was laid on Jesus, God had to turn his back. Why? Because he could not see sin. He did not want to see sin. He hated sin. And that's another reason that darkness was on the face of the earth. And at that point, God laid all the sin of mankind upon Jesus. And folks, I hope you understand what he is saying here. There was never a time in his life that he was separated from God. There was never a time in his ministry where he was separated from God. He was totally alone, totally abandoned on the cross. And my question, and the question is, says, my God, my God, why? I'll tell you why. Turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5. I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he, God, made him Jesus who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Folks, the only way you can find peace, the only way that you're going to heaven is through the blood of Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. That's why. Why? Folks, He loved us. He loved us. It was love that kept him on the cross. It was love when he was praying in Gethsemane, Lord, if there's any other way. It was love when those spikes were going to, into his hands and feet. It was love the whole time he was on 
the cross. John 15. Go with me to John 15. John 15, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is Jesus talking to the disciples. Jesus knew what joy was. Christians know what the joy of the Lord is. I'll tell you what it means. J is for Jesus. You find Jesus and you'll find joy. O is for others. Put others before yourself. Humble yourself. Quit being arrogant. Quit thinking you can do everything on your own. Quit thinking that you can make it. You need God. You need Jesus. And you need to help others. And the why is yourself. Do it for yourself. But that is third. Do it because God told you to. Because God called you to salvation. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Here it is. Greater love has no, no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You realize Jesus is your friend? We sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. Could I tell you about a friend that would never let you down? Could I tell you about a friend that has never lied to you? Can I tell you about a friend that is always there for you? Can I tell you about a friend that forgives you of every sin you've ever committed? Can I tell you about our best friend, Jesus? The last thing I want you to see, not only the greatest example of humility, not only the greatest act of love, but the greatest testimony ever shared. Verse 35, some of those who stood by when they heard and said, look, he's calling out for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of the sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to drink. Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and take him down. And folks, Elijah wasn't coming. Jesus wasn't looking for Elijah. They were just thinking and trying to figure out what Jesus was doing. Then the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Why? No more animal sacrifices. No more sacrifices. From now on, we had direct access through prayer to the throne of God. Another thing that happened in the Matthew account, there was an earthquake. God moved. God moved. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this, and with his left last breath, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. What did this Roman soldier witness? He witnessed a man on the cross. He watched his blood drop down, drop by drop. He saw Jesus in one last deal. They, there were seven sayings from the cross, Jesus said, and I'm telling you, the last, he said, it is finished. His work was done. He died. He breathed his last breath for you and I. Ephesians 2, and I close with this. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. Folks, you can't save yourself. You can't clean up enough. You can't be good enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't do good, enough goods. You can't do enough to get into heaven. It is by grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. It is through grace that we are saved. It is God's mercy that we ask for. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith is belief. Belief. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus lived a perfect life. I believe that Jesus died on a cross for my sins. I believe that Jesus rose again. Folks, he's not in the grave. His body's not even there. He's at the right hand of God, just waiting for God to say, go get my bride. Are you Ready, folks, I believe with all my heart we're living in the last days. The last days. 
For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The free gift. The free gift. But do you know, there was a price paid for that gift, and that price was the blood of Jesus Christ. As we close and as we prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper, I just have one question I want to ask you today before we go into the Lord's Supper. If you were to die today, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven according to the Word of God? If not, we have a time of invitation. We have a time when God will deal with you. We have a time when God will put His hand on your heart Sometimes your heart starts beating. Sometimes your hands get sweaty because the Holy Spirit is telling you, man, you need to get saved. You need to get saved. You need to come down front. And if you hear that, would you listen to the Holy Spirit? Would you come and make a public profession of faith? We'll help you with that. We will tell you. We will show you exactly what you need to do. The greatest gift ever given was the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And if you're a Christian here today, are you ready for the Lord's Supper? Have you prepared your heart? Have you confessed your sin? Have you made things right with God? Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this day. God, thank you for the cross. God, I pray that we just understand the picture of what you did for us. And God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, Today would be their day of salvation. God, it's, it's free. It's a gift. He loves us. He died for us. He wants to see us in heaven. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work here today. God, thank you for the Christians that are here. And God, I pray it truly, it, it's a memorial service. It's a solemn time. It's a time of reflection. And God, I pray that we would use this invitation, whether we come to the altar or just bow our heads and pray right where we are. God, I pray that everyone, everyone will prepare their heart for the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?